So in today's video, we're going to cover all kinds of breadcrumbs connected to this topic of red hair and bloodlines. We're going to talk about everything from genetics to legends and myths to the physical features of Jesus Christ. So let's get started. This topic first came up for me around 2017 when I started to ponder on this topic of red hair. In fact, it was so fascinating to me. I wrote an article titled, The Sacred Mystery of Blood Sacrifice. And I brought up so many dots to connect that this article is pretty lengthy, <laughs> but it's still available on my archived blog. So I'll have a link to that down below. But in this article, I explored the interesting history of redheads, how for centuries, people with red hair have often been the brunt of cruel jokes, persecution, execution, and in some historical accounts, genocide. So much so that over time, having red hair, culturally speaking, became a negative thing. You've heard of the terms, the red-headed stepchild, gingers, carrot tops, and on and on and on. In a lot of movies, they portray the bullies to be redheads. So as I was pondering this, I noticed that all throughout history, wherever you see the adversary working so hard to persecute and oppress, whether it's a people or a principle, you have to ask the question, why? What truth about these people or this principle is he trying to cover up? Wherever or whomever Satan attacks, you can rest assured that there is something good he doesn't want us to discover, some truth that he doesn't want us to figure out or understand. So as I got studying about red hair, I began to learn that in ancient times, redheads were actually considered special and holy, as red is the color of blood, life, and creation. I also learned <laughs> that there are a lot of wild theories out there about the rare phenomenon of red hair. Now, as I was pondering all of this, I was also doing some research on my blood type. So my blood type is A negative. Now, for those of you who don't know, RH negative blood is very interesting because not only do scientists pretty much have no clue where it originated or evolved from, they speculate that it was introduced in Europe and spread from there, but many actually believe that it is of non-human origin. This mysterious blood produces antibodies that will fatally attack a mother's newborn baby if the baby's blood type is positive. In fact, up until 1973, when the Rogam shot was discovered, it's estimated that RH disease claimed the lives of 10,000 babies every year in the United States alone. By 1973, after the shot was introduced, it was estimated that in the United States alone, over 50,000 babies' lives were saved. The use of RH immune globulin to prevent the disease in babies of RH negative mothers has since become standard practice, and the disease has been virtually eradicated. Without it, most likely all four of my children would not have survived birth because they all are positive. So as I got thinking about this, I thought about Joseph and Emma Smith. Now they had four children who died at birth. Now my mother has RH negative blood and her mother has RH negative blood. So I began to wonder if I might be related to Emma, already knowing that I am related to Joseph through my mother's mother's line. And on my mother's side of the family, through her mother, we are related to Joseph's wife, Emma. She's my fifth cousin, seven times removed. Our common ancestor is Christopher Salmon, who died in Sherwood District, Nottinghamshire, England. Now this is funny because right before I came across his name just now while editing this video, I just watched a documentary on salmon, as in the fish. In fact, the video had my pay attention number on it, 311. It was three minutes and 11 seconds long. And I just said to myself, salmon sounds pretty good right now. That was not even five minutes ago, and I sit down and pull up Christopher Salmon. I don't believe in coincidences. And there's that color red again. Salmon is known as the red fish. 
This is also interesting. The surname Salmon actually comes from the name Solomon. I spent the afternoon working on Christopher Salmon's line and unfortunately it reaches a dead end around the 1400s. But I did learn that the very first recorded ancestor with the Salmon name in England was of French origins and their family left France because of the persecution of the Huguenots. Pretty interesting. I can't help but wonder if this line goes all the way back to King Solomon. Hence the name Salmon that means Solomon. And during my research on Rh negative blood, I discovered something interesting. I learned that my freckles and blue eyes are considered mutations. Having blue eyes, blonde hair, and freckles is apparently rare. I'm also the only child in my family covered in freckles, and I didn't pass the freckles on to my kids. Though this combination is rare, I learned that red hair, which is more rare, coupled with freckles and green, hazel, or blue eyes are reported as more common among RH negative carriers. So just like the RH negative gene, the red hair gene, the MC1R, is recessive. This means that these redhead traits will only appear in a child if both the child's parents supply the gene. This means that one in four people from the general population carry the red hair gene, which means that out of two random people coming together, their chance of having a red-haired child is 1 in 64. So within the general population, 1 out of 4 people carry that gene, and 85% of people who have freckles also carry that gene. And while red hair and Rh negative blood are passed recessively, freckles are not recessive, but rather dominant. The majority of people with these traits of fair skin, freckles, blue and green eyes, and especially red hair, seem to be connected to Ireland, Scotland, and Scandinavia. Now, there are some strange theories out there, really strange theories. So if you explore this topic, proceed with caution. Use your discernment. There's a theory that says that RH positive blood means that your blood is positive for the rhesus monkey protein, which is a protein found in monkeys which according to this theory means that these humans descend from ancestors who were bred with monkey DNA and that the Rh negative blood is the pure bloodline, which is why a mother's body rejects a baby with the Rh positive protein. And then of course, other theories say that it's the other way around, that the Rh positive protein can be traced all the way back to the earliest human DNA and that the Rh negative DNA was introduced at a much later time and something that's not of this world. And through an online paper written by the University of Utah, it's been noted that human anti-Rh and animal anti-Rh are not the same. This tells me that we can rest assured that monkey blood was never mixed with human blood. Now, even more rare than RH negative blood is something called RH null. This is the world's rarest blood because it doesn't contain any RH antigens at all. There are less than 50 people in the world who have this blood type. Universal blood for anyone with rare blood types within the RH system, its life-saving capability is enormous. And because of this, it's highly prized by doctors although it will only be given to patients in extreme circumstances and after very careful consideration because it can be difficult to replace. Doctors refer to it as the golden blood. Now, I remember when I first came across this information several years ago, I thought about Bible history and the only accounts that I'm aware of, the first account being in Genesis chapter 6. This is prior to the flood and what led up to the flood. It says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, now the footnote for that says sons and daughters of God, saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. 
The footnote on that says interfaith marriage, so not married within the covenant. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now clicking on the footnote of giants, it takes us to Moses chapter 8. And in those days there were giants on the earth, and they sought Noah to take away his life. But the Lord was with Noah, and the power of the Lord was upon him. It goes on to talk about how Noah calls these sons of God to repentance, and they respond by saying, Behold, we are the sons of God. Have we not taken unto ourselves the daughters of men? And we are not eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. And our wives bear unto us children. And the same are mighty men, which are like unto men of old. So I'm thinking of these big, fearsome men. I'm thinking of mythological gods. I'm thinking of Hercules. (laughs) Since they were so proud of their lifestyle and this offspring they had created with the daughters of men, they hearkened not unto the words of Noah. They were wicked. Now, in the Bible dictionary under giants, it says unusually large, tall persons apparently having great physical strength. They are mentioned both before the flood and after. Now, these giants definitely had genetic mutations. According to the Bible dictionary, a 12-fingered, 12-toed giant is mentioned as one of the sons of the father of Goliath. I've talked about before how fairy tales often contain histories and truths that people were trying to protect or that they wanted to pass down to the next generations. They didn't want to lose that information. They wanted to protect it, so they would put it into the form of a story, usually a children's story. So when I think of giants, I think of the story of Jack and the Beanstalk. So let's talk about that for a minute. The story of Jack Spriggins and the Enchanted Bean was published in 1734, but it's believed that the original story is older than this account, dating back to Proto-Indo-Iranian variants, Proto-Indo-European languages, and some even believe all the way back to 4500 BC. So now in the story that was published in 1734, we're given the name Jack Spriggins. Now the meaning of the name Jack means God is gracious. And the meaning of the name Spriggins in ancient Anglo-Saxon culture was given to a person because of their physical abilities. Now we know that in the story, Jack is given some magical beans. Now the symbolism of beans are that once they are planted, they represent resurrection. They grow spiritually upwards towards heaven. Beanstalks can also represent immortality. I find it interesting that the giant lives above the clouds, sort of denoting that he comes from above. He also lives in a castle. Castles usually represent the temple where heaven and earth meet, the covenants. And just like in the scriptures, the sons of God who had broken their covenants and were sinning still saw themselves as covenant sons of God. This grieved Noah, and it grieved God. So Jack, a poor country boy, trades the family cow, his family's wealth, all that they have, for a handful of magic beans, which grow into a massive towering beanstalk reaching up into the clouds. So far, to me, this symbolizes giving up all that you have in this life to attain something greater, something eternal. 
Jack climbs the beanstalk and finds himself in the castle of an unfriendly giant. The giant senses Jack's presence and cries, fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. So the giant threatens to eat Jack. To me, the beanstalk also could represent the family tree. Now Jack escapes by chopping down this beanstalk or this branch of the family tree. The giant chases after him, but falls to his death. He falls from heaven. Outwitting the giant, Jack is able to retrieve many goods once stolen from his family, including a bag of gold, an enchanted goose that lays golden eggs, and a magic golden harp. What does the harp remind you of? (laughs) We're gonna talk about this later on in the video. But yes, to me, that's significant of the harp of David. To me, this symbolizes a bloodline or a birthright, a lineage. This giant was stealing everything from his family. The giant living above the clouds in a castle, to me, is symbolic of being a son of God. Specifically, the sons of God spoken of in the Bible. They rebelled against God, deterring them from being able to enter those covenants with God and receive those eternal rewards. In other words, the family inheritance. Now, I skipped a lot of details in this story, but it has everything from an angel slash fairy trying to help Jack learn the mystery of his father and come to know him. His father being kind and compassionate and serving the poor and the needy. A special book that is of great interest to his father that he desires the giant to read. A reference to instilling a desire in Jack to ascend the ladder of the beanstalk. Transgression and losing power, but sacrificing the family cow and that divine power coming back. Even taking oaths and promising obedience. And then this final message at the very end. The fairy charged Jack to be dutiful to his mother and to follow his father's good example which was the only way to be happy. This reminds me quite a bit of the story of David and Goliath. David has the harp. These Philistine giants wanted to conquer Saul's kingdom. So Goliath and the Philistines represented the enemies of God, wanting to destroy his kingdom. Just like in the story of David and Goliath, when we are righteous and true to our covenants, The Lord God can deliver us from our enemies, restoring all that has been lost or stolen, redeeming us, and bringing us into our Father's kingdom to receive his inheritance. And just like the parable of the vineyard, those who withdraw from Christ and rebel against God are cut off from the tree. Now, it's also interesting that the giant points out that Jack is an Englishman and he mentions his blood the blood of an Englishman, the blood of England. And I think of the line of David being prevalent in the United Kingdom, specifically pertaining to the family of Christ, which we'll talk about later on in this video, how they fled to England. The blood of the royal house of David was living in England and all of the United Kingdom for that matter. So we have this giant saying, I smell the blood of the royal Davidic line. I'm coming after them to steal and destroy. As we'll talk about later on in this video, this giant could also represent the early Christian Orthodox Church and the Roman Empire. Most importantly, the adversary who comes to steal and destroy. But just like Israel, those who let God prevail triumph over the adversary. So these sons and possibly daughters of God, were marrying outside of the covenant, but they were still referring to themselves as covenant children. Now, many people will say that this is the first account of a non-human DNA being introduced into the human DNA. However, according to an Enzyme article written by Hugh Nibley and published in 1976, that's actually not the case. The only official account that I'm aware of in the Bible is the miraculous and supernatural way that Mary, the mother of Jesus, conceived. So Jesus had the DNA of a mortal mother 
as well as the DNA of God the Father. This would mean that he would look like his father. So hold that thought and let's go back to talking about Rh negative blood. As I mentioned, there are many wild theories covering everything from copper blood, iron deficiency, gods, aliens, the Nephilim, the Book of Enoch, to the legends of the Holy Grail. There's even been research done on personality types connected to certain blood types. And that's when I came across a list of traits that are said to be connected to those with Rh negative blood. Those traits are a feeling of not belonging, truth seekers, sense of a mission in life, empathy and compassion for mankind. And then they mention what they call ESP ability or intuitive abilities, predominantly blue, green, or hazel eyes, piercing eyes, and tend to be people who are very compassionate and healing. Now, when I first read this years ago, I immediately thought of our Savior Jesus Christ, and then of the prophet Joseph Smith, who was known as a seeker of truth and described as a tall, elegant-looking man with piercing eyes. Now, around this time, I had come across the book called Dynasty of the Holy Grail, Mormonism's Sacred Bloodline by LDS scholar and BYU graduate Vern G. Swanson. In this book, he quoted some early leaders of the church. The first quote was from the October General Conference of 1854, where Apostle Orson Hyde spoke of the literal seed of Jesus Christ. And then in 1859, Brigham Young clarified, Hidden in the blood of many LDS runs the blood of Israel from numerous directions, including that of the Savior. But it is specifically through the divine blood right of Christ through Joseph Smith Jr. that all members of the church are lawful heirs of the promise. According to Burns' research, many early church leaders openly spoke of being literal descendants of Jesus Christ and spoke of the prophet Joseph also receiving this revelation for himself. Vern cites that in 1899, member of Congress and LDS Church Apostle George Q. Cannon reportedly told a Salt Lake Temple Assembly, there are those in this audience who are descendants of the old 12 apostles, and shall I say it? Yes, descendants of the Savior himself. His seed is represented in this body of men. Joseph Fielding Smith, president of the church, was the last to make mention of this topic when in his response to a question about Christ having children was, Yes, but do not preach it. The Lord advised us not to cast pearls before swine. Today, the church has no official position on the subject and has made it clear that Christ having offspring is not church doctrine. So this is something we'll have to set aside and wait for a future day when all things will be revealed. Now, I put out a video a couple of months ago about England and the royal bloodlines, and I talked about this topic. So I'll just revisit a couple of those things that I had shared just based off of the Jewish culture at that time and the Jewish law. For a lot of these things that Jesus would have been doing, he would have needed to have been married for that to be acceptable and okay in his culture. The first point I'll mention real quick is all of the women that traveled with Jesus and his disciples. On their ministry, they would travel from villages to cities, staying together. According to Jewish law and tradition, I'm quoting this excerpt here, it says, While arguing that a young girl should not be married to an old man, or to an infant son, daughters should be married when they reach puberty, and the same position is taken with the respect to sons. It quotes a scripture and says that a father should have his son married early in order to ensure grandchildren and thus be able to fulfill the injunction of Deuteronomy 4.9. I have heard some theories out there before that talk about Jesus's mother, Mary. Her husband, Joseph, was a much older man, that he was a widower, and he already had children. And this theory is given to sort of justify how Mary remained to have that title, the Virgin Mary, throughout her whole life is because they believe she remained a virgin even after marriage, and that it was possible because she had married this older man who already had children, and Jesus was therefore the youngest, the baby of the family, and those other siblings were his step-siblings. But according to this, the daughters were not to marry an old man, but rather somebody close to their age so that they could have posterity and there wouldn't be any issues with that. A grown man wouldn't marry 
a child the same age as his children to be the mother or the stepmother of his children. That would just make no sense whatsoever. And it would have been something that would have been considered absurd (laughs) to have your young daughter, as soon as she's reached puberty, to marry a man who could be her father and he already has children the same age as her. It just makes no sense whatsoever. Right when I said that, (laughs) I saw the number 311. This is the 311th voice recording on my voice recording app. So that's my pay attention number. (laughs) I feel there's something to that. But also the sons needed to get married as soon as possible as ancient Judaism regarded marriage as a religious obligation that a man needed to get married and raise a family, that that was priority. Jewish girls were to get married as soon as they reached puberty, so usually around the age of 14, 15, or 16. And what was the age for young men? Well, according to this source, the school of our Ishmael taught, until the age of 20, the Holy One, blessed be, he sits and waits. When will he take a wife? As soon as one attains 20 and has not married. He exclaims, blasted be his bones. Other sources are quoted here as saying between the ages of 16 and 22, and additional sources say between 18 and 24. So clearly, the max is about 24 years of age. In the ancient Jewish culture, if you were beyond 24 and you were still a bachelor, there was something wrong with you. It was assumed that you were unclean and sinful because they believed that an unmarried man was continually having sinful thoughts. Therefore, that would make him unclean and unworthy to participate in certain things such as teaching in the temple or being a rabbi. So not only did Jesus travel with his disciples and these other women, they traveled together, stayed together. But we know that for a time, Jesus was a trusted rabbi. He was allowed to go into the temple and read from the scrolls and teach. People in the community would have seen his caravan and known that he was traveling with these women. And had these been unmarried women... And had Jesus been an unmarried man, this would not have been appropriate or acceptable. He would not have been called a rabbi. Single women didn't just travel around with single men. As stated before, as soon as young girls reached the age of puberty, they were to be married. That was their goal. Their families helped them achieve that goal so that their families weren't looked down upon. Same with the young men. As soon as they were of age, their number one priority was to get married, to bring grandchildren into the family, and also so that their families were not looked down upon. So it would be very, very, very unlikely that grown single women and grown single men would travel together in caravans, ministering and preaching the gospel and being allowed to teach in temples, being called a rabbi. This would not have been acceptable. They wouldn't have had any credibility from these communities. And we know that aside from the Pharisees, they had quite the following of believers. In our day, we see the prophet and the apostles travel with their wives as they minister all over the world. It would have been no different back then. Also, at Jesus' burial in the tomb, we know that there were women present. And many believe that, again, it wouldn't have been appropriate to have women who were not the mother or wife of the deceased to be near a male corpse as it's being prepared. And in Mark chapter 16, verse 1, it says, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. So Mary, Jesus's mother, and Mary Magdalene, and Salome, who it is believed was Jesus's aunt, Mary's sister. So it would have been family members traditionally who anointed the body and brought spices, which would lead us to believe that Mary Magdalene was also a family member. And then of course, the very first person that Jesus appears to after his resurrection is Mary Magdalene, not his mother, not his apostles, but Mary Magdalene, which tells us clearly she had the most special relationship with the Savior than anyone else on the earth. And in the other Gospels that are in the Apocrypha, they talk about this tension between Peter and Mary, how Peter was always very envious that Jesus was so close to Mary and sometimes would tell her things that he wouldn't tell them. 
Peter was Jesus' right-hand man, his closest apostle, but yet he had an even closer and more personal relationship with Mary. Kind of reminds me of early church history. After the prophet Joseph Smith died, his wife Emma wasn't in agreement with Joseph's right-hand man, Brigham Young. They butted heads on a lot of things, as did Mary and Peter. So much so that Emma separated from the church and went her own way with her family, where Brigham Young went and guided the saints out to Utah, where the church has flourished and spread all over the world to this day. We see a similar pattern back then in the time of Christ, After his resurrection, it appears that the apostles went off their different ways to carry out their missions and spread the gospel. You even had Paul a lot of times at odds with the apostles. And then you have these historical accounts that we'll talk about in this video today of Jesus' descendants, his mother, his uncle, Mary Magdalene, and others who went to Europe and spread the gospel over there. So you have the spreading out of his disciples going in these different directions until eventually there was no one left on the earth with that authority and we entered the great apostasy. It's interesting to see a similar pattern between Mary and Peter as we saw with Emma and Brigham. There is even a book called The Gospel of Mary, which is believed to be her own writings about the gospel and Christ's ministry and the things that he taught her. Back then, this wouldn't have been acceptable for a woman to do, to write a book of scripture, to be a spiritual or religious leader or influence. Today in the church, we see that. We have the General Relief Society Presidency, the General Young Women's Presidency, the General Primary Presidency. We have a lot of leadership positions throughout the church worldwide where women are called to and they serve. But back then, this wasn't the case. So again, that's another interesting point to consider of why it would have been okay for Mary Magdalene to write a book of scripture and share things that Christ had taught her, things that caused Peter to be envious. Why is it that she had this personal relationship with Jesus and was a spiritual leader of sorts in her day? Unless she had been Jesus's wife, this would have been unacceptable. And the last point I like to bring up is what might have been written in those pages that are missing from the Bible of Jesus's life from age 12 to 30 years old. That's a whole chunk of time missing from his life. Years where he may have been married, years where he may have had children, years where he may have traveled abroad. Why did someone feel that it was necessary to remove all of that information and knowledge about Jesus's life from the scriptures? Was it to protect Jesus's family when they were fleeing from persecution? Or was it to help justify new doctrines that were being introduced into the Orthodox Church that were very different from the original doctrine? Such as consecrating your life to the Lord, meaning a life of celibacy, not getting married, not having children, that this was considered holy and pure when Truthfully, it defies God's plan for bringing children to the earth and creating eternal families. It would make sense that if Jesus were married and had children, this would be something that would be removed out of the scriptures to help justify this doctrine of a holy life of celibacy, not getting married, not having posterity. Is it possible that those early church fathers didn't want people to view Christ this way, not wanting to view him as someone who was married and did have children because he was the ultimate example. And if he was teaching marriage and having children and that being central to God's plan, this would go against those doctrines that were being introduced. And last but most important is that Jesus Christ is our example. We are commanded to be like him and follow in his footsteps. He showed us the way in every aspect of his gospel, which started with his baptism. We know that he was perfect. He didn't need to be baptized, but everything he preached, he did as well. Marriage and the family is essential to the plan of salvation. It's essential to his father's plan of happiness. It is the core doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Why would the Savior not live the way that he taught us to live? We know that we have heavenly parents, a heavenly father, and a heavenly mother. We know that we have the potential to become like them someday. 
why would the Savior be exempt from that? If family and posterity is so essential, why would the Savior himself not have a family and posterity? If he is the king, why would he not have a queen? Again, this is something we'll have to wait for a later day when that missing scripture is restored and those truths are revealed. Now let's talk about this symbol right here known as the Red Hand of Ulster, which is on the flag of Northern Ireland. Keep in mind that Northern Ireland is a part of the United Kingdom. I'm quoting an article that says, There is no symbol more vilified and despised in the United Kingdom than the Red Hand of Ulster. The flag is so detested by the Scottish Parliament that to wave or display this flag in public could constitute an offense under their new anti-sectarianism legislation. This is no accident, for the Red Hand of Ulster is the key to understanding the purpose of God and destroying Babylon. British Israel students will know that the Red Hand is the symbol of the Zara line from Judah, reunited in the purpose of God with the Perez line of the Davidic monarchy through the marriage of Milesius and Haramon of the Zara line, with David's descendant, Tia Tuffy of the Perez line in Ireland. This Haramon was a king of the scarlet thread branch of Judah, and his genealogy can easily be proved through study. So I've talked about this in other videos, and I'll have a link to that down below. The symbol of this branch of Judah is the red hand, symbolizing the scarlet thread placed around the wrist of Zara by the midwife. The red hand also speaks of the bloody hand of a covenant God. Covenants in ancient times were made by cutting the hand or wrist of both parties, and then they would clasp hands, thus mingling the blood. Hence, a covenant partner would become your blood brother. It is from this practice of cutting covenant that we get the handshake of friendship. It goes on to talk about that this is why the British soldiers were famous for centuries as the Redcoats, because they took an oath to the British monarchs who are descended from the Scarlet Thread line. It should be noted that the symbol of the Perez line, the Davidic emblem, which the royal family bears, is of course the Royal Harp of David, which is a national symbol of Ireland. Also, the royal family bears the standard of Judah, which is the lion. The lion emblem is often seen in rampant form, as in the lion rampant of Scotland, which is the royal standard of Scotland. When it is in this form, it is red in color, symbolizing the lion of the tribe of Judah. This speaks of the blood-drenched body of the Savior on the cross. And personally, I think that would also symbolize the bloodline. So he goes on to talk about how so many despise the red hand of Ulster, the symbol, and they're trying to get rid of it. But the author says that God has a glorious purpose in Ireland, not just the north, but the south also. And as the world knows, there has been constant conflict between north and the south of Ireland. Generally, this conflict is talked about as a religious conflict, Protestant versus Catholic. Actually, it's a matter of unionists versus loyalists. The loyalists were mostly Ulster Protestants who wanted Northern Ireland to remain within the United Kingdom. Irish nationalists and Republicans were mostly Catholic and wanted Northern Ireland to leave the United Kingdom and join a united Ireland. My brother served a mission there, and I remember hearing all about it. So according to research, among the world population, only 15% is RH negative. The Basque people of Spain and France have the highest percentage of RH negative blood per region. About 30% of their population has RH negative and about 60% carry one R negative gene. There is also a theory circulating that this is a location where some of the offspring of Jesus went into hiding during the great Christian persecution. Forensic evidence taken from the mummy of Ramses II reveals that Ramses was a redhead with white skin, as were the fathers and kings of his line. So how do we go from royal kings having red hair and that being a good thing to redheads being persecuted, hunted down, and killed? In 15th century Germany alone, 45,000 redheads 
were declared witches and burned. Red hair was considered a sign of witchcraft. Birthmarks, freckles, warts, and moles were thought to be marks of the devil. Red hair was often associated with betrayal because of Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. And in Germany, those with freckles and red hair were persecuted because of this connection to Judas. And now I'm going to share with you some insight with Beth on this topic. I think you're really on to something with talking about how it's interesting redheads became like like almost the more undesirable quality or something which I think is so funny like before back in my dating days I totally had a thing for boys with red hair I just thought I don't know if it's because they were unique or what but I was just like oh I was just thought they were so attractive <laughs> like um I guess maybe a certain look or something I don't know um some men with red hair over others but anyway I I've always thought red hair was so cool and Maybe part of it was my mom always dreamed of having a little redheaded boy. She really wanted a little redheaded boy. She used to have a picture up on the fridge, this little redheaded boy she saw in a magazine. And she just, it would just help her picture her little boy one day. Well, anyway, my brother has totally blonde hair. <laughs> so she didn't get her redheaded boy. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll get the redheaded boy. And um, Rob does have red that grows in his beard. And his brother ha- uh, has a total redheaded son super bright red hair but which is funny because they have like like indonesian origin but you know partly but one thing that i'm seeing come up which again i think it's funny this redhead theme is coming up the past few weeks i saw something that said the ruling class of ancient time were usually redheads and redhead like like kind of designated oh this is a ruler this is someone that could be a ruler so i think that's really interesting um like i guess even pharaohs in egypt they would choose red-headed pharaohs and um in europe as well and the other thing is they've done some dna testing on some of the rulers of egypt and seen that they weren't even egyptian like a lot of them were european <laughs> and they were like really tall and like abnormally tall red-headed and then they'll either have they've they found some that are have semi bloodlines which is like the line of shem the hebrews came through right and then um but i know japheth was given like his blessing was he was they were going to be the rulers and they were ended up being europeans you know like from that line so it is kind of interesting maybe that red hair like goes back to to noah i mean i guess everything goes back to noah so there must have been red hair in there um but maybe it was connected to kingship lines. I know the Jaredites, like Adina peoples that they've found and those ones that your, um, I think your great, great uncle or something found, they were like big giants with like red and blonde hair. Or so, and they look like Vikings. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I do think it's really interesting. The redheaded thing with the, like the Holy Grail bloodlines, right? Like the bloodline of Christ that was supposed to rule. Um, remember like when they started taking that over and the, the Roman Catholic Church was like, well, if you can't beat them, join them. And they kind of took on Christianity too. And then different groups were like, hey, like, I want to be the ruler. So they actually, there was like this big campaign to like basically kill off all those of the Holy Grail bloodline. And so all those legends we have, like King Arthur, he was, um, his duty was to protect that royal bloodline of Christ. So his duty was to like to find and protect the, the Holy Grail, right? Which is simple for the Holy Bloodline. So um, it is interesting. It does seem like as early as the 500s, maybe even sooner, because that's when Arthur came around. Arthur died when that huge earthquake that that pushed the world into like a whole year without sunlight and started all the plagues and like led to the Catholic Church taking control, all that stuff. I think it like totally marked the end of light, like when light totally left the earth and it started. I mean, that was literally the beginning of the Dark Ages. (laughs) And um, anyway, King Arthur, he died when that started. So you have to think King Arthur is literally like the last of the faithful were around before the world went right to apostasy. So he was guarding royal bloodlines. That was his job. There was a whole campaign to kill off all the unicorns in England, like much later. And ancient texts say there used to be unicorns and then they were all hunted down until they were completely killed off. The unicorn, that's a symbol of Ephraim. It's a symbol of of very holy bloodlines and important bloodlines. What if they're not talking about unicorns? What if they're talking about 
the descendants of Christ and the descendants of the apostles and those that were meant to rule and meant to lead, right? They were actively trying to kill them off and hunt them down and kill them off. And those that had the bloodlines basically had to go into hiding. So they had to like, uh, they became like farmers and and moved out to the countryside and they get away from, they get as far as away from the crown as they can, right? And they have to keep their identities very quiet because you don't want anybody to know because those kind of people are being hunted down and killed off and by those seeking power, right? Anyway, it just makes me think of like, uh, like you know, the story of Sleeping Beauty, especially the Disney one. I, I just love their version. And as soon as they knew she was in danger, where did they send her? Out to this very humble cottage to be in hiding where nobody knew her identity. And she didn't even know they didn't even tell her to keep her protected. I just think a lot of that went on. So I could totally see that same pattern probably happened with redheads too. If redheads were known as the ruling class and then suddenly there was this campaign from someone that wanted to take over and be the rulers. So what do you do? You create a smear campaign where you're like, you know what's awful? Redheads. You know what's the worst thing you could be born as? A redhead. <laughs> Kill the redheads. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like I could totally see that what you're saying. So yeah, I thought that was super interesting. Um Hey, Lindsay, I came across another red hair folklore, I guess, of someone significant. So I thought I would share. I was reading a book about um, holy bloodlines, holy girl stuff. Anyway, and they mentioned um, this painting that had been done, you know, probably back in the Renaissance or whatever. But anyway, um, in this painting, Mary Magdalene is... It, it notes that she's pictured with her customary long reddish hair and um, that this was like an accepted fact that Mary Magdalene had red hair. <laughs> so I was like, oh my goodness. So um, anyway, I thought it was really interesting and it's actually showing Mary Magdalene um, pregnant, a child with the royal birth line of the Holy Grail. And um, it shows her red hair, and then it talks about the symbolism of the white and the green robe she's wearing. Uh, let's see. With her customary long reddish hair, she wears the white bodice of purity and the green dress of fertility, while making her gravidity very apparent in an abdominal nursing pose. The scene is composed by, or completed by a shell-designed chalice upon the front of her skirt. No painting could be more forthright in its grill representation of the expectant messianic queen. Uh, so anyway, kind of interesting right there. And, um, this book had been talking about the symbolism of long hair, um, like in the Rapunzel story and in artwork. It was like a symbol of virginity and purity and modesty. So like a, a woman had really long hair uh, even while naked, she could maintain modesty and, and be able to cover up her body and put that long hair. So the long hair was like seen as that symbol of modesty and purity. So anyway, and they were just like, they were like, yeah, like, for example, this Mary Magdalene painting. What was stood out to me was that she was traditionally pictured and painted always with red hair. <laughs> there that is again. And I just thought it was interesting, this this next part was from Wikipedia, talking about uh, this painting, Caravaggio, I believe, and that he was from France, and that there was this popular legend in his time that after Christ's death, his faithful female disciple Mary Magdalene moved to southern France where she lived as a hermit in a cave. So this is, you know, this is something we've talked about before. I know you've read before about her moving to France um, and, not, and the royal bloodlines, like, kind of coming out of there for a bit. And that the legend said she was transported seven times a day by angels into the presence of God, where she heard with her bodily ears the delightful harmonies of the celestial choirs. Early artists had depicted Mary ascending to the divine presence through multicolored clouds accompanied by angels, but Caravaggio made the supernatural an entirely interior experience with the Magdalene, Magdalene alone against a featureless dark background. 
caught in a ray of intense light, her head rolling back and her eyes stained with tears. Anyway, I just thought it was really interesting. Like, one, that there was this legend that she was ascending to heaven to commune with heaven every day or, you know, whatever. This painting captured, like, that didn't necessarily mean she was, like, physically ascending up into the sky, but that she was having these um, internal connections with the divine, these spiritual, you know, like, that kind of connection. Uh, so anyway, just kind of really interesting. I, I actually thought when I saw it, that it was depicting her in labor because she's pregnant and she looks like a woman that is trying to deliver a baby. That's what I got out of it. But anyway, anyway, I just thought I'd point it out because the red hair theme seems to be coming up a lot. And I think that's very interesting. So of course, when I, I see it noted, I'm like, ah, I have to tell Lindsay about this one. <laughs> Lindsay, I'm watching this film that was filmed, I think back in the seventies or something. Um, it's some Old Testament series, super old. Um, it's actually pretty good. Uh, I just happened to see it, like saw Saul and David, and I was like, "Oh, what's that about?" Clicked on it, and it's actually like pulled me in. It's pretty good. <laughs> I just paused it at the forty-four mark. Um, anyway, the big thing that stood out to me is they went above and beyond to make the King David character be a redhead. And like, like really redhead. <laughs> so they have him like as a as a teenage boy come and kill Goliath, and it really stands out because everybody else has either pretty dark features or Saul has like blue eyes and ashy brown hair. And then here comes David, and he's like just really different complexion wise, and he's got this like kind of crazy red hair, and um. Maybe it was to try and match the actor who they put in here. But you can, I tried to take screenshots and you can see how different they have them look from everyone else. And so this is really standing out. And I'm like, okay, this is either an artistic choice, like to make the David character stand out so everybody can always pick out who David is, right? Because everybody else kind of looks the same with the same color hair and everything. But because we've talked so much about redheads, and um, that seeming to, like, really follow some of these birthright peoples, <laughs> I was like, you know, <laughs> let me just look into that. So I Googled it and came across this website, this blog post someone made, and it's called King David, a Fiery Redhead. <laughs> and um, it totally says... Uh, so the guy starts and he says, when you think about the Israelites and the people from Bible times, what do you think they looked like? I think they had dark olive skin, brown eyes, and really dark brown hair. But today while reading my Bible study, I read something that took me by surprise. In volume 12 of First and Second Samuel of Through the Bible Commentary Series, they said that King David had red hair. And this is their quote. Um, when this verse says that David was Rudy, it means that he had red hair and he had a temper to match his red hair, a hot temper. But in addition to that fact, he was redheaded to the fact that he was redheaded. He was a fine looking fellow. So this guy goes on and he's like, he's like, oh, I was totally shocked by this. Could this be true? Um, and so he decided to look into it further. And he kind of deep dive and he said, uh, Rudy, the word R-U-D-D-Y, Rudy. Or it could be ruddy. I don't know. How do you say that word? I've never known how to say it. It's used four times in scripture. And he lists the verses there. And it's all Old Testament. And he says each time the word is used as a description of how someone looked by using three different words in Hebrew. These words are, um, it looks like Adem, Adam, and Admonai. Okay, I'm going to pause right here. Yes. The word Adam, and in Hebrew, Adam, literally means red. So, the minute I heard that, that it pertains to the words Adam, Adama, um, which could mean red clay or red ground, since Adam was made out of the earth, it had me thinking if this also could be symbolic that Adam had red hair. Um, each word refers to the color red. 
based on the word ruddy or ruddy, it is probable that King David had red hair. And then he has on here um, the four times that they're mentioned. So um, let's say the first time he was Rudy with a fine appearance. I guess that's talking about David. And then another one, Rudy and handsome, and he despised him. Another one, um, Songs of Solomon. My lover is a radiant and ruddy. <laughs> and, then, and then the last one is their bodies more uh, ruddy than rubies. So anyway, um, and then he goes on to show that the word Adam in Hebrew is a word used for um, to be dyed red uh, is what it means. <laughs> and then he actually went on and said, he's like, could this be possible? Are there any other redheads? He goes, and then I wondered, are there any other redheads that were in King David's like um, ancestry? Could this even be possible? And then he said, well, it does point out that his nine times great uncle Esau did have red hair. So I guess it's possible that there were the genes in his like gene pool. But then I was thinking, I was like, well, yeah, like we've talked about like Abraham had red hair, you know, and these different prophets. Anyway, I just thought it was really interesting and it made me wonder, it just, I don't know, it just really made me think, you know, we've kind of wondered before, like, oh, maybe the redheaded gene that is maybe that's like the savior's descendants or something like maybe it means descendant of judah maybe all these redheads popping up in northern israel it's because they're of the tribe of judah like i'm sorry up in ireland you know in scotland and it's interesting because on like the seal or the crest of scotland they have the harp of david in ireland they have the harp of david <laughs> england has the harp of david like they all have um the lions of judah and the harp of david on their insignias for their royal families right indicating they're of the tribe of judah and um not only the tribe of judah but that there are descendants of the royal line of david so i thought that was really interesting because these areas have predominantly red hair and he apparently that was like a feature he was known for like why don't we talk about that why does that not come up when everybody's convinced that all of ancient Judah all looked exactly alike when they all came from all these different tribes, you know? And we know that they didn't all look that way. I also thought, like, you know, just the descriptions that have been left behind of the Savior with talking about how he had auburn hair and that there's that slight red tinge to it. Also, point two, who he was a descendant of, he was a descendant of David. He was a descendant of a bloodline that carried that redheaded gene. Another one to add to the whole redhead um, study that's super interesting. Um, yeah, and the other thing I wanted to tell you about, just really quick, this is kind of... Okay, I'm going to pause right here. Let's talk about these connections to England with Jesus's family. So I'm just quoting from some sources that I'll have linked down below. Is there any proof that Jesus lived in England during the missing years? So they're talking about the pages that are missing in the Bible where the record of his life stops after age 12 and doesn't pick up again until about 30 years old, right before he begins his ministry. So they say, physical evidence, no. Circumstantial evidence allied with common sense, yes. Lots of it. There's more than enough evidence to persuade anyone with a truly open mind that Jesus spent his missing years in what is now called England at Glastonbury. The source says, In the Irish version of the Gospel of Matthew, we are told that Druids came to the East to worship the King of Kings. Britain was ruled by the Levitical Druid religion, and the word Druid means truth, their motto being the truth against the world. Glastonbury was a Druid center of learning, and there was an observatory on the summit of Tor Hill for the study of astronomy. They were waiting for their Messiah, Yesu, Jesus, or Jesus, the truth made flesh, to come. In other words, the real true Druids were the Levitical priesthood of the ten lost tribes of Israel in exile. 
I came across this source while editing this video. It says, the English word magic is derived from the magi who famously appear in the story of the three wise kings from the nativity. The Irish word for magic is dreokt or dreakt. And while there is no etymological relationship, there is a connection. Dreokt or dreakt is formed from dreoct, meaning druid-like. The druids in Ireland and elsewhere are thought to have been priests of an ancient religion, and so too are the magi. What is interesting is the definition provided by the online etymological dictionary, which says that magic is first attested in the English language from the late 14th century and is the art of influencing events and producing marvels using hidden natural forces. So in other words, a priest could be using their priesthood or simply offering up a prayer. And if a marvel or a miracle is the result of that, it was considered to be the result of a natural hidden force. In other words, a force that someone on the outside looking in couldn't explain because they couldn't see it. This is where the word magic first showed up, which translated to druid-like. This is when the Roman propaganda really began to unfold and paint these religious people in a negative light to help justify their cause in pushing the Orthodox Christianity onto those who were practicing the original Christianity. It appears that they were most likely Levitical priests in exile. Historical records show that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a member of the British royal family descended from David and also the priestly line of Levi. She was the cousin of Elizabeth. This Levitical connection is confirmed both in the Gospel of Luke and also in the Quran. Mary's Levitical and Davidic lineage meant that Jesus was therefore eligible to be both king and high priest, also in fulfillment of prophecy. So it goes on to talk about something that I brought up to my kids and my husband just a few days ago. I said, isn't it interesting how it talks about in the scriptures that the wise men traveled from the east, but they followed a star that they saw in the east. So that's really interesting because if you're in the east and you see a star in the east and you live east of Bethlehem, it would take you all the way around the other side of the world <laughs> and you would eventually come from the west towards Bethlehem. It would make sense if you saw a star in the east and you followed it and it led you to Bethlehem, you would have been in the west in order to see that star in the east. So I couldn't help but wonder if possibly this was a discrepancy lost in translation that differed from the earliest writings. So the source says, Is it not perfectly logical then that Druids, seeing his star in the east and being the Levitical priesthood in exile, therefore knowing the Old Testament prophecies, would come to the Holy Land to pay homage to their prophesied Messiah and long-awaited King of Kings? It took them almost two years after seeing the star to prepare for and make the journey from Britain, and that is why Herod slew all the male children up to two years of age after having talked to them and made diligent inquiry about the date of Jesus' birth. And this is interesting because as I'm reading the copied and pasted text in my notes, it says on my Word document that right at this sentence, I am at 1,444 words. <laughs> There's that pay attention number 144. This source proposes that it's very possible and makes a lot of sense that the three wise men were druids from the Isles of Britain. Now, this is also interesting because I've been working on a video for quite a while now that I'm hoping to get out in the next week all about the origins of Christmas and a lot of misconceptions about the quote-unquote non-Christian groups who have these winter solstice traditions. And I have a lot of things that I think are going to be really eye-opening. I've been wanting to share for quite a while now, so I'm almost finished with editing that video. The thought has crossed my mind more than once over the last few years that there's a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of propaganda 
written by the Romans and the Roman Orthodox Church about these quote-unquote non-Christian groups, such as the Druids. So I'll talk more about that in my Christmas video. An article written in 2006 in the New Era talks about how Mary and Joseph were both of royal lineage. Had Judah been a free and independent nation ruled by her rightful sovereign, Joseph the carpenter would have been her crowned king, and his lawful successor to the throne would have been Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Mary's ancestors were the same as Joseph's. She was a descendant through the royal line of King David. Matthew says Joseph was a son of Jacob, and Luke says that he was a son of Heli. It appears, however, that Jacob and Heli were brothers and that Heli was the father of Joseph and Jacob, the father of Mary, making Joseph and Mary first cousins with the same ancestral lines. Though the New Testament doesn't define the genealogy as being Mary's, many scholars believe that it is indeed her line. Now, the New Testament Gospels do not mention Mary's name specifically when listing lineage. However, many scholars believe that the double listing of Joseph's lineage is actually Mary's. However, because it's not definitive, there are many theories out there about Mary's ancestral lines. There are a lot of historical, oral, and written accounts of these, if you want to call them legends, that Jesus had visited England when he was a youth. What we do know about Mary's mother, Anne, and her husband, we know from the New Testament Apocrypha in the Gospel of James. This was written about 150 AD, and according to an article which I have linked below, it says, The righteous Joachim and Anna were childless for 50 years after their married life. In their old age, the archangel Gabriel appeared to each one of them separately, telling them that God had heard their prayers and that they would give birth to a daughter, Mary. Then Anna conceived by her husband, and after nine months bore a daughter, blessed by God, and by all generations of men. Joachim was of the lineage of Judah and a descendant of King David. Anna was the daughter of Mathan, the priest, from the lineage of Levi, as was Aaron, the high priest. Mathan had three daughters, Mary, Sophia, and Anna. Mary married, lived in Bethlehem, and gave birth to Salome. Sophia married, also lived in Bethlehem, and gave birth to Elizabeth, the mother of St. John, the forerunner. Anna married Joachim in Nazareth, and in old age gave birth to Mary. Joachim and Anna had lived together in marriage for 50 years and yet had remained barren. They lived devoutly and quietly, and all of their income was spent one-third on themselves, distributed one-third to the poor, and gave the other third to the temple, and they were well provided for. Once, when in their old age, they came to Jerusalem to offer a sacrifice to God. The high priest, Isaacar, reprimanded Joachim, saying, you are not worthy that a gift is accepted from your hands, for you are childless. Others who had children pushed Joachim behind them as one unworthy. This greatly grieved these two aged souls, and they returned home in great sorrow. Then the two of them fell down before God in prayer, that he would work a miracle with them as he once had with Abraham and Sarah, and give them a child as a comfort in their old age. Then God sent his angel, who announced to them the birth of a daughter most blessed, by whom all nations on the earth will be blessed, and through whom the salvation of the world will come. Anna straightway conceived, and in nine months gave birth to the Holy Virgin Mary. Joachim died a few years later at the age of 80, after his daughter went to live in the temple. Anna died at the age of 70, two years after her husband. There are a lot of historical, oral, and written accounts of these, if you want to call them legends, that Jesus had visited England when he was a youth. Legend claims that the uncle of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea, was a rich merchant with a seagoing fleet that traded into the ancient tin mines of Cornwall and lead mines in the Mendips near Glastonbury. Occasionally, he would take his nephew Jesus with him. Glastonbury was a Celtic learning center, and Jesus is said to have recognized something special about that area. While there, it was during the Jewish Feast of Sukkot, otherwise known as the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. This is recorded in Leviticus chapter 23, 
where God wanted the Israelites to observe this festival by living in temporary shelters for seven days as a reminder that when their ancestors were in the wilderness, God provided them booths to dwell in. Even today, many Jews celebrate this holiday by building their own booth or sukkah, a four-sided temporary structure with palm branches for an open roof in order to see the night sky and sometimes canvas for the walls. For seven days during this holiday, many observant families will eat their meals inside of this booth, sort of like a little fort. And others even sleep in it each night. They have a camp out in this booth. So according to legend, while Jesus was visiting Glastonbury, he built one of these booths, which is called a wattle, which was made up of poles intertwined with twigs, reeds, and branches. And then he dedicated it to his mother, Mary. And this is believed to have happened around the year 20 AD. Because Jesus dedicated the booth to his mother, Mary, many believe that England was Mary's native homeland and that Jesus had gone to visit her family. According to Jawet Cardinal Baronius, appointed librarian to the Vatican in 1591, he lists Joseph of Arimathea's party one by one in his famous annals. One additional member was Jesus's mother, Mary. The legend says that Joseph of Arimathea, accompanied by many others, friends and family, fleeing not only the Roman Empire, but also the Sanhedrin. And the only safe place to go was the Isles of Britain. Once there, legend says that Joseph created an evangelical center at Glastonbury. He built a center at the location of this wattle or booth that Jesus had built as a youth and dedicated to his mother. After building this center or church, he dispatched missionaries to various parts of Europe to carry the teachings of Jesus. Joseph maintained this missionary training center until his death at Glastonbury in 82 AD, where he is buried. And this could be a whole other video where, according to legend, Joseph of Arimathea was the keeper or the protector of the Holy Grail. This is the foundation and the beginning of the legend of the Holy Grail with King Arthur. It is also believed that Jesus's mother, Mary, is also buried at this location. Now, around 1100 AD, there was a fire and this church burnt to the ground. And so what you're seeing are the ruins of this structure. This image here is a banner that can be seen in St. John the Baptist Parish Church of Pilton. It's a banner that was embroidered in the early 1930s and shows Joseph and Jesus arriving at Pilton Harbor on the edge of Somerset. In a short poem by William Blake, from the preface to his epic Milton a Poem, dating about 1804, best known today as an anthem called Jerusalem, written with music, this poem was inspired by the apocryphal story that a young Jesus, accompanied by Joseph of Arimathea, a tin merchant, traveled to this area and visited Glastonbury during the unknown years of his childhood. The lyrics read, And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountain green? And was the holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? So according to legend, Joseph of Arimathea, arrives in Glastonbury following the crucifixion, accompanied by 12 companions, which included Mary, the mother of Jesus, her sister Martha, and Mary Magdalene. Tired and weary, Joseph thrust his staff into the ground on Wearyall Hill and rested. In the morning, his staff had taken root and grown into a miraculous thorn tree that bloomed twice a year. Descendants of this tree survive in Glastonbury today, including one at the Abbey. This is where it gets exciting. It is also known as the Holy Thorn, or you may recognize it as Holly Thorn or Holly Berries. You know, the holly that we decorate with and sing about at Christmas time. Legend says that this miracle impressed the Druids and that it represents a symbolic and tangible link between the old and new belief systems and that it's probably not a coincidence that the locale around Glastonbury 
was the site of ancient Druidic temples. The thorn tree growing at the abbey itself was said to have survived into the 17th century when the Puritans came to power and cut it down because they declared it a relic of nature worship. They felt that it was evil. The stump of the tree finally died in the mid-1800s, though the Glastonbury thorn lives on in its offspring. The Glastonbury thorn does not behave like other native hawthorns on account of flowering in winter as well as spring. It is this trait that has continued to fascinate and attract people, and that in turn has helped perpetuate the legend that continues to fascinate and attract people. It was also custom to send the sprigs of the Christmas flowering thorn to the members of the royal family prior to the Reformation. On occasions, the abbot of Glastonbury used to send the monarch of England some Christmas flowering thorn. It is also claimed that Charles I received some Christmas flowering thorn, causing him to comment that the Glastonbury thorn appeared to follow the old style calendar, rejecting the Gregorian reform of the calendar that had been accepted in Europe in 1582. In fact, sprigs of thorn continued to be sent to the Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, until her death. Now before we go on, let's explore the color red a little bit more, especially in fairy tales. In the fairy tale Red Riding Hood, it seems very symbolic of the girl in the red hood being a type of symbol of Mary Magdalene, who was often depicted as wearing red. The wolf disguises himself as her grandmother, and once he's gained her trust, he tries to eat her, just like the giant wanted to eat Jack. The blood of an Englishman, the blood of the royal line. Now where she is covered in a red cloak, it reminds me of being covered in the blood of Christ. In the Brothers Grimm version, the wolf actually eats her, and a woodcutter who's out chopping down trees, again, this makes me think of Jack chopping down the beanstalk, he comes with an axe, cuts open the wolf, and rescues Little Red Riding Hood. The girl could also represent Covenant Israel. In earlier accounts of Little Red Riding Hood, the wolf lures her into bed with him, and then he eats her. This right here symbolizes unfaithfulness and sin, breaking that covenant. But the red cloak symbolizes being covered in the blood of Christ. And the woodsman represents Jesus Christ rescuing his covenant people. In more modern day fairy tales, I'm reminded of the character Rudolph. Now, Rudolph is a Jewish surname. It comes from the Hebrew word Rudolphus, meaning redhead. This surname is the most common surname among Ashkenazi Jews. I did not know that. <laughs> I thought that was pretty awesome. I just had this feeling to research Rudolph, and there it was. Here's a picture of Maya Rudolph, a well-known American actress whose father is an Ashkenazi Jew. She comes from a long line of Jewish philanthropists named Rudolph. Rude is the color red, even when described with skin complexion. A ruddy or ruddy skin complexion means red. So let's explore the history of the story of Rudolph. It was actually written by a man named Robert Louis May. Right away, I began to wonder if Robert might be Jewish because of the name he chose for the main character. And as I read on, I learned that yes, indeed, he was. He was born in Long Island, New York, and grew up in an affluent secular Jewish home. He was actually asked by his employer to write this story as part of a Christmas giveaway. He decided when writing this children's story to make a reindeer the central character of the book because it was a Christmas animal. And it had to be a sort of ugly duckling who had a lot of heart to make it with Santa. He drew on memories from his own painfully shy childhood when creating his Rudolph story. Now where the focus was on Rudolph's nose, how he was ashamed of his nose because it was different than everyone else's and it was so noticeable. I began to wonder if Robert May may have had painful childhood experiences involving his own nose. As it said, he drew on painful childhood memories and experiences 
when writing this story. And what color was Rudolph's nose? It was red! A color that made him stand out and different amongst his friends. A color that made him persecuted. Now here's an interesting observation. I got thinking about these two younger brothers in the Bible, in the Old Testament. You have Joseph, who was the youngest at the time of all of Jacob's sons, who was the favored son and therefore was persecuted by all of his brothers. And it was said that he had red hair. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on in the video. Then you have David, who was the youngest of his brothers, who is also have said to have red hair, who became king of Israel. So you have two great leaders who delivered their people in the Old Testament. They both have red hair and both were shepherds who tended to their family's flocks, just like Jesus who is the great shepherd. And they are both ancestors of Jesus Christ, who just like them is the great deliverer of his people, of all of God's children. We have the descendants of David and Joseph living in the United Kingdom. Hence the unicorn and David's harp on the royal coat of arms on the royal coat of arms. I've talked about this before, so I will have a link down below to that video. If you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. And in the UK is where we find the highest percentage of redheads in the world. So speaking about Christ and his ancestors and their red hair, now let's talk about what Christ looked like. Okay, let's go back in time now and explore historical records and accounts from key figures of that time describing what Jesus looked like. Here is a description right here. It says, Lentulus, the governor of the Jerusalem, to the Roman Senate and people. Now it's important to know that there are about 75 copies of this manuscript. There's translations in English. I believe that the original was in Latin. And so all these different copies translate a little bit differently and seem to have subtle changes. So this first one we're going to talk about, and then later I'm going to bring up a second one to show you those changes. Greetings. There has appeared in our times, and there still lives, a man of great power, virtue, called Jesus Christ. The people call him prophet of truth, his disciples, son of God. He raises the dead and he heals infirmities. He is a man of medium size. He has a venerable aspect and his beholders can both fear and love him. His hair is of the color of the ripe hazelnut, straight down to the ears, but below the ears, wavy and curled with a bluish and bright reflection flowing over his shoulders. It is parted in two on the top of the head after the pattern of the Nazarenes. His brow is smoothed and very cheerful with a face without wrinkle or spot, embellished by a slightly reddish complexion. His nose and mouth are faultless. His beard is abundant of the color of his hair, not long, but divided at the chin, so split in two. His aspect is simple and mature. His eyes are changeable and bright. He is terrible in his reprimands, sweet and amiable in his admonitions cheerful without loss of gravity. He was never known to laugh, but often to weep. His stature is straight, his hands and arms beautiful to behold. His conversation is grave, infrequent, and modest. He is the most beautiful among the children of men. Now scholars say that this account right here by Pabulus Lentulus is fictitious because there was no Pabulus Lentulus listed in history as the governor of Jerusalem. However, it's been noted that in Latin, the name or the word Pabulus Lentulus actually means a dullard public official. So it's a generic title and it literally translates to an official of the people. So it's believed that this is a general description and account under the guise of a general public official. Okay, next in this letter, Pilate tells Emperor Claudius of the Jews' crime of killing their Savior. He describes Christ's miracles and relates that the Jews accused him of being a magician. Pilate believed the accusation and allowed Jesus to be executed. 
However, the soldiers who guarded his tomb revealed that he had risen. Even though the Jews bribed them to be silent, Pilate warns the emperor of the deceptive nature of the Jews at the end of the letter. Included here are three versions, including the first and the second Greek forms. So copies of this letter are available in the Congressional Library in Washington, D.C. To Tiberius Caesar, a young man appeared in Galilee preaching with humble unction, a new law in the name of the God that had sent him. At first, I was apprehensive that his design was to stir up the people against the Romans, but my fears were soon dispelled. Jesus of Nazareth spoke rather as a friend of the Romans than of the Jews. One day, I observed in the midst of a group of people a young man who was leaning against a tree, calmly addressing the multitude. I was told it was Jesus. This I could have easily suspected. So great was the difference between him and those who were listening to him. So he's saying he looked very different than all the people around him. And then he explains why. His golden colored hair and beard gave to his appearance a celestial aspect. He appeared to be about 30 years of age. Never have I seen a sweeter or more serene countenance. What a contrast between him and his bearers with their long black beards and tawny complexions. Unwilling to interrupt him by my presence, I continued my walk, but signified to my secretary to join the group and listen. Later, my secretary reported that never had he seen in the works of all the philosophers anything that compared to the teachings of Jesus. He told me that Jesus was neither seditious nor rebellious. So we extended to him our protection. He was at liberty to act, to speak, to assemble, and to address the people. This unlimited freedom provoked the Jews, not the poor, but the rich and powerful. Later, I wrote to Jesus, requesting an interview with him at the Praetorium. He came, and when the Nazarene made his appearance, I was having my morning walk, and as I faced him, my feet seemed fastened with an iron hand to the marble pavement, and I trembled in every limb as a guilty culprit, though he was calm. For some reason, I stood admiring this extraordinary man. There was nothing in him that was repelling, nor in his character, yet I felt awed in his presence. I told him that there was a magnetic simplicity about him and his personality that elevated him far above the philosophers and teachers of his day. Now, noble sovereign, these are the facts concerning Jesus of Nazareth, and I have taken the time to write to you in detail concerning these matters. I say that such a man who could convert water into wine, change death into life, disease into health, calm the stormy seas, is not guilty of any criminal offense, and as others have said, we must agree, truly, this is the Son of God. Your most obedient servant, Pontius Pilate. This next description of Jesus is found in the Arco volume, which contains official court documents from the days of Jesus. So this information substantiates that he came from racial lines, which had blue eyes and golden hair. It says, I asked him to describe this person to me so that I might know him if I should meet him. He said, if you ever meet him, you will know him. While he is nothing but a man, there is something about him that distinguishes him from every other man. He is the picture of his mother, only he has not her smooth round face. His hair is a little more golden than hers, though it is as much from sunburn as anything else. He is tall and his shoulders are a little drooped. His visage is thin and of a swarthy complexion, though this is from exposure. His eyes are large and a soft blue and rather dull and heavy. This Jew or Nazarite is convinced that he is the Messiah of the world. This was the same person that was born of the Virgin in Bethlehem some 26 years before. So this is interesting. In this version, in this description, he's described as tall, whereas in the first description we read, he's described as average. Both these descriptions being from the same manuscript, but different copies. So all of the other descriptions describe him as tall. So it makes sense to say that he indeed was tall. And in this copy here, also from the letter from Lentulus, 
It describes his hair as the color of wine. Wine is red. Okay, this here is from Josephus from the Antiquities of the Jews. These are his historical first century writings from book number 18, chapter 2, section 3. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third day. As the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians so named for him are not extinct at this day. Now this goes on to talk about how the Catholic Church Fathers gave him a completely different description in their writings than all of the other historical figures. So all of the other historical figures seem to match. He's a man with a different skin color than those around him who live in that area. He's got lighter hair, reddish skin, blue eyes, where the Catholic Church Fathers wrote about him as having dark brown to almost black hair and dark beard with olive skin. As we can see throughout history, the Christian Orthodox Church was always changing the records to fit the narrative that they wanted. But in another description from Lentulus, the predecessor of Pontius Pilate, who is said to have prepared a report to the Roman Senate concerning Jesus and containing a description of him, he said that Christ possessed a tall and handsome figure a countenance which inspired reverence and awakened love and fear together. Dark, shining, curling hair parted in the center in Nazarene fashion and flowing over the shoulders. An open and serene forehead, a face without wrinkle or blemish, and rendered more beautifully by its delicate ruddiness. A perfect nose and mouth, a full red beard of the same color as the hair, and worn in two points, and piercing eyes of grayish blue. He's saying that his hair was darker, but says that it's the same color of his red beard. So here we get the description of red. Now in that earlier account I read, it described him as having golden hair, but also let us know that that was the result of exposure from the sun. So let's talk about the Shroud of Turin. It's a length of linen cloth bearing the negative image of a man who many believe is Jesus of Nazareth and believe that this fabric is the burial shroud in which he was wrapped after the crucifixion. Some historians believe this was the shroud owned by the Byzantine emperors but disappeared during the sack of Constantinople in 1204. The shroud has been kept in the royal chapel of the Cathedral of Turin in northern Italy since 1578. So I remember when this project I'm about to tell you about first made its debut on TV. I remember watching this and being so amazed and fascinated by what I learned and what I saw that I immediately wrote an article about it on my archived blog. So I have a link to that down below if you want to check it out. It was through this project that we have been given a very vivid depiction of what Jesus looked like. So Ray Downing, president of Studio Macbeth, who oversaw this project, said that Jesus was more than just a spiritual event. Studying the shroud to produce the 3D face of Jesus, we encountered scientific evidence that the resurrection was a real physical event that happened in a moment of time 2,000 years ago. The Shroud of Turin provides actual scientific proof that Jesus rose from the dead. It was scientifically proven that the image impressed upon the Shroud of Turin was done so by a powerful amount of light that pierced through the fabric, imprinting a permanent image of Jesus' face. Cutting-edge modern skills were required to pull an accurate flesh-and-blood face from a piece of fabric so old. The year-long project culminated with a team of graphic artists using the newest technology to create a computer-generated image. One of the main problems, the condition of the shroud, provided key clues. 
the team realized there were distortions in the image on the shroud because the fabric had been wrapped around the body. The solution was to realize that the shroud wasn't hanging on the wall. It was wrapping a corpse. That's the crux of the problem. The face is hidden in there. So as you can see, here is the shroud. In this particular image, someone has gone over the marks on the body with red coloring to show the areas of injury. Then in this image right here, you can see the negative, just like a photographic negative. You can clearly see the figure of a man, a face, a beard, arms and legs. So from this negative, they were able to get this next image right here, which adds a little bit more depth and color. And then they did some guesswork on the final depiction with hair color, skin color, eye color. Here's another one with a little bit different coloring. And to me, this depiction looks a lot like this statue right here, which looks like the Christ that we see in the artwork within our church, which looks a lot like this depiction right here, painted by Del Parson. I remember ever since I was a little girl, this painting right here always had quite the impact on me. Something about his eyes in this painting just seemed to pierce right through me. And I have always reverenced and loved this depiction, which also looks very similar to the Christus statue at the Salt Lake Temple, also at the temple in Rome. And as you can see right here, as you can see from this negative, there is a split in his beard. You'll also see it on statues and other artwork that depicts Christ. Now you'll also see the split beard here on the Christus statue. And Beth is going to talk a little bit more about that. I thought your idea to look at the Shroud of Torn picture was such a cool idea and something I thought was really interesting. On that um, Shroud of Torn picture, I feel like I remember he had like two beards kind of thing like they were like divided in the middle they were like two coming down I remember thinking like oh that's so odd like I that doesn't like it doesn't match the picture in my head right because the Greg Olkson picture is a picture in my head <laughs> but what was really interesting when I was reading through those descriptions and there was multiple descriptions from like multiple different historical sources was um, a couple of them mentioned that, that he had the divided beard. And I was like, oh, interesting, because that totally matches the short part. <laughs> so anyway, I love that you get excited about this too. <laughs> I'm like really enjoying listening to you get excited about it and talk about it and kind of deep dive in that. Because I think, I, I do, I think like our, our physical features tie us to our families and help us understand inheritance. And it's really important to understand the inheritance of Christ. Like, because he had very divine inheritance, and then to also understand, like, his descendants as well. So anyway, I do think those, I thought that was interesting when you talked about the ruddy complexion and um, what that is. Because I've seen that come up before, like, in historical descriptions of people, and I'm always like, they had, they, maybe they blushed easily. Like, I don't, I'm like, what does that mean? So, um, yeah, that was really interesting. Like, oh, okay, freckles, yeah, and, like, the... And just the kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I remember that now you're talking about Joseph was said to have red hair. Someone else that was said to have red hair was Abraham. And um, the only person I've had heard talk about that was one of my religion teachers when I was in Nauvoo. And he was really, really great scholarly guy. Um, but he talks about one of the facsimiles where there's like Abraham on the table of sacrifice, right? And the angel's coming to save him. Well, there's an alligator underneath that in the Nile River. And he talked about that there was this ancient custom in Egypt where they would, and I think I've shared this with you before, it sounds familiar, I think it's been years so. But there was this ancient custom where for the Pharaoh to renew life so he could live forever or live for a long time or whatever, he would choose someone to like be sacrificed in his place, like in his behalf and feed the alligator because apparently that was a life giving God, the alligator or crocodile or whatever. And so what they would do is they had to pick a young man who was without blemish, very interesting, um, with red hair and, um, he would be Pharaoh for three days. Like he would sit in Pharaoh's, on Pharaoh's throne for three days and act as Pharaoh. And then at the end of the three days, the priest would then, um, this is awful, but they would cut out his heart. And while it was still beating, they would 
feed it to the crocodile at the Nile River. And they believed that this would renew the pharaoh's life. You can see, like, remnants of truth being completely twisted to, a, like, a sadistic and satanic, satanic worship methods, right? But you can see, like, the three days of life, all that stuff. In the Jewish tradition, every year they would sacrifice, or maybe it was on Jubilee years or something, but every year they would they would find a red heifer sacrifice, and um, they had to find a red heifer without blemish, and they took that to mean with no other color hairs on it. And then there's supposed to be like a final red heifer sacrifice before the Messiah comes. So like in today's day, they've been trying to develop another red heifer with not a single hair on it that's a different color, and they've been like basically genetically modifying red heifers, like doing a lot of DNA and cloning, trying to get this perfect red heifer for the sacrifice. Anyway, they used to do that. All of these things are symbolic of Christ. They were supposed to point toward Christ and help us learn of him. So I think it's really, really interesting that the red heifer sacrifice, one, it's a red heifer, could have been black, could have been white, white, super symbolic, right? But it was a red heifer. And then, again, that ancient Egyptian um, weird ceremony they would do was to choose a young man with red hair without blemish. So very interesting. Those different descriptions talk about, like, um, that he was without blemish. Like, the people that saw him, he had a really, like, just clear, tight, and perfect face, you know? So anyway, I, I think those things are meaningful, and I think they're worth noting, you know? So... Anyway, so you have Abraham, that happened to you. So I think that's really interesting. Joseph um, would have had red hair as well. And, um, you know, he's a huge symbol for the Savior, thinking about it just now, with how, like, he came and was a servant and then ended up jailed. And then when he got out of prison, he, like, completely redeemed his people and he was the king, pretty much king over all the land kind of thing. Um that completely parallels the life of Christ and his coming here to serve, dying, being hidden for a long time, and then when he comes back, he'll reign as king and deliver his people. So anyway, yeah, I think these things are totally worth noting. I've always thought it's interesting. Um, Joseph Smith had, um, he was actually described as having auburn hair by some accounts and just had like a blondish tint in the sunlight, kind of like a dirty blonde hair. I mean, we have locks of his hair. We can see it's kind of more dirty blonde than auburn. But um, I always thought that was interesting in one of the descriptions. Someone said he had auburn hair. <laughs> and what's really interesting with him and Hiram, because we have their death masks, um, their profiles, they have these just huge noses, right? And it was very, like, a big feature in the Smith family, those big noses. But when you look at their profiles, along with a lot of, like, Native American profiles and Jewish profiles, like, they very much look like Semitic people, uh, just with the blonde hair, blue eyes kind of stuff. So anyway, how people look, it helps understand what tribes they belong to, helps understand their missions in life. Um, anyway, I just think it's really interesting. So in this part of the conversation with Beth, she's talking about different perspectives and conversations out there where people talk about how they believe because Jesus lived in Jerusalem, he would look like a modern day Jew. And in those conversations, people often confuse Israelites, Jews, and Hebrews as all being the same thing. So she clears some of that up. And I'm just thinking, but Hebrew is not the same as as. Jewish. <laughs> like, Jewish is one tribe of the Hebrews, and the Jewish people we know of today, like, that's been developing for thousands of years. <laughs> anyway, I just, I thought it was interesting sharing the different um, historical records that said he did not look like modern day Jewish people and also things that modern day prophets had said about how he looks. Different records when he visited different native groups and different groups from around the world. He was always noted to have blue eyes and like light hair and all that stuff. So anyway, um I just think that's really interesting when people just completely discount all of that and they're like, but I feel this is how he would look because in my mind that's how he needs to look. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> Anyway, I just, there's so much history 
with his links to England and Mary's links and Joseph of Arimathea and all of their links to there. But it doesn't matter how much you share about that. I think it's interesting how much it's dismissed. Um, yeah, I just like, uh, okay, because that painting was approved by the First Presidency and they wouldn't approve it until he got it right. And they kept being like, no, you need to change it some more. No, you need to change it some more. And they wouldn't accept it until they were like, okay, that's what he looks like. And it's like the prophet in the First Presidency of the time. And I'm going, if anybody knows what he looks like, those are the men I would trust. Do you know what I mean? So anyway, what Christ looks like, not that big a deal, right? Well, we'll all find out one day. But there are some really, really, and you know this, there are some really amazing things to learn about his heritage and his descendants and, and knowing kind of physical characteristics that follow those bloodlines is really interesting and really helps us know like who we are today as modern day Israel, you know, and that not only that, but that a lot of, lot of early members of the church were, were his descendants. You know, that's harder to put those pieces together and to realize that if you're completely convinced, no, he had to look this exact certain way like a Jewish person today that's in Jerusalem. Especially because not all Jewish people look that way. Like, I had I grew up with Jewish people, and I remember this one girl I was friends with, I had no idea she was Jewish until it came up one day in school because she had blonde, curly hair and blue eyes, you know? And again, again, that's just so funny to think like every Jewish person has to look like an Ashkenazi Jew or something. You know, there's so many different Jewish people. It's kind of funny to me. So anyway, anyway, I just want to talk to you about it because I know you've done a lot of research too on and just what you were talking about with the RH negative, how that tends to follow these groups that um, have like the red and the blonde hair and the freckles and they're of Northern Europe and all that kind of stuff. And that there's a possible connection to him. And anyway, I just, I think it is important right now. There's so much of connecting the human family to each other. And there's so much of like the phenotypes that, that people have that connect them back to who they are. You know, the phenotype being like the outside features, the features you can see with your eyes that do connect them to their family groups and to their ancestors. And it's, it's really important. And it's important to be like connected to those people. Anyway. So one thing seems to be clear that the color red all throughout history has been symbolic of and connected to blood and sacrifice. So just why were redheads considered vampires, witches, people you couldn't trust, people who had tempers, were angry, basically vilified in every way. And in modern day culture, crediting the TV show South Park were considered to have no souls. Why were redheads the target of genocide, to be despised and attempted to be erased from history? Who were they descended from? And did their bloodline or blood type impose some kind of threat or fear for what couldn't be understood? Were their unique characteristics, traits, and possibly spiritual gifts interpreted as witchcraft? Were they symbolic of a bloodline or divine family and therefore a threat to the throne? And as scientists and scholars have said, that RH negative blood is not of human origins. Could the red hair have been interpreted as some kind of a punishment, curse, or mark of an ungodly sin? Theories all over the world, all throughout time, will support each of these narratives. But one thing's for certain, the adversary definitely had a reason to stir up hatred, anger, misunderstandings, and false information about red hair. And that tells me that if you have red hair, you're pretty special, which makes you a target for the adversary. Now, I don't have red hair, but I definitely have freckles, and I have the RH negative blood. And I was teased for most of my childhood about my freckles. But you know what? I grew to love them. They make me unique. They make me different. And I feel like they're pretty special. I definitely feel like they tell a story about where I come from and those who came before me. To everyone out there watching this video, no matter what color your hair is or what you look like, you are special. And if the adversary has made you feel any other way, it's because he knows it. We may never learn the answers in this life, 
But one thing's for sure, someday all of this will make sense. And until then, continue to learn about your heritage and you'll begin to learn why you're so special.